Anything that's hurting my mitochondria is making me less metabolically healthy. There's one word that your listeners need to walk away with and understand. It's mitochondria. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Welcome to Commium. My name is Jeff Krasnow. Today, we're discussing mitochondria and their vital role in human health. So mitochondria are wee small organelles in the cell that produce energy, otherwise known as ATP or adenosine triphosphate from the food that you eat and the oxygen that you breathe. And they do this through a process known as cellular respiration, which has three stages. Number one, glycolysis. Number two, the citric acid cycle, aka the Krebs cycle. And number three, the electron transport chain. Now, these fascinating jelly bean shaped structures actually have their own genetic material, all of which you inherit from your mother. And that's distinct from the DNA in the nucleus of the cell. Now, their origin goes back billions of years when a prokaryote archaea engulfed a purple bacteria and this romantic tryst birthed aerobic respiration, essentially the production of energy with the use of oxygen, and this springboarded complex life. It's pretty amazing. Oh, the mitochondria in our cells animate literally everything that we do from the conscious viewing of this video to the unconscious digestion occurring in your gut. Now, each cell in our body, with the exception of mature red blood cells, contain mitochondria and a different number of them. Your brain cells, your neurons, your cardiac cells, brown fat, and muscle cells boast the highest concentrations of mitochondria. And that makes good sense given the significant energy requirements of those cells. So in this episode, we'll be hearing from three brilliant doctors, Dr. Stephen Gundry, my dear friend Casey Means, and Robert Lustig, as we explore how mitochondria function and occasionally dysfunction. Now, our first guest is Dr. Stephen Gundry. He is a physician, a former cardiac surgeon, and a researcher who investigates the impact of diet on human health. Now, he's going to set the stage for our discussion with his helpful and humorous metaphor that explains mitochondrial function. He calls it the Mito Club. Without further delay, here's Dr. Stephen Gundry. Okay, so I think this is a, a good time to talk a little bit about energy production in the body um, and the mitochondria. And you use this absolutely hilarious and very fun metaphor in the book uh, with the nightclub analogy, <laughs> the mito club. Yeah, so, um, so the electron transport chain, which uh, was proposed by Sir Peter Mitchell, who also finally won the Nobel Prize, uh, the electron transport chain, uh, simplistically, I call a nightclub that has an entrance on one end of the nightclub and an exit on the other end of the nightclub. And uh, 20-somethings, which we'll, which we'll call energy substrates, like glucose, like proteins, like free fatty acids, uh, enter this nightclub. You know, I call it the Mito Club, and it's the hippest, hottest place in town. And they go there for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to couple with oxygen. And if they couple with oxygen, then they leave the nightclub via a one-way revolving door. And this is the process of leaving the electron transport chain coupled, uh, produces ATP, literally very much like water going over a water wheel, um, you know, producing energy. And there's only one way out. And in this nightclub, the 
the electron transport chain is, is really changing energy levels of electrons and protons. It's getting them excited. And we laugh uh, in longevity that, you know, the only purpose of life is to move an electron from one level of charge to another. But I digress. <laughs> so, so things, and, and believe it or not, this club is hot, it's steamy, it's sweaty. There are so many hormones going on. There's drinking and all for the purpose of, of getting this coupling going. Well, that's all well and good. But the process of coupling uh, has a lot of side effects. There are fist fights. There is a lot of drunken craziness. And we actually have bouncers in the nightclub. And people probably know of at least one of the bouncers. It's glutathione. The other bouncer, which is a surprise to almost everybody, is melatonin. And yeah. it's a surprise to almost everybody that we only have two antioxidants that actually work in our mitochondria, glutathione and melatonin. But we'll digress for a minute. In the process of looking to couple up, electrons will also, just because everybody's rowdy, will couple with oxygen by, if you will, mistake. And we now know that that coupling process produces free radicals, produces reactive oxygen species. And while some of those are pretty good, they make it a pretty interesting place to be, a lot of them we now know is one of the major processes that damage the club, the mitochondria. And pretty soon, you know, you've got beer all over the place and broken chairs, and it's no longer the hip place that you want to be. So that's how the electron transport chain works. And part of what glutathione and melatonin do is to tamp down this unwanted coupling, if you will, and try to get oxygen to couple with protons and make some CO2 and head out the door. What was fascinating to me when, when Peter Mitchell proposed this, a lot of very smart chemists, chemists said, no, wait a minute. It, the process of making ATP using this system, using mitochondria, you should take one molecule of glucose and always get 32 molecules of ATP. Every time. It's a chemical equation. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, and Peter Mitchell said, well, wait a minute. You know, you guys are all running these experiments with isolated mitochondria. And guess what? You know, sometimes we're getting you know, 28 molecules. Yeah, of ATP. right. Yeah. yeah and, and what's happening to those guys? So it wasn't until really when his theory was accepted that almost simultaneously, and he got the Nobel Prize, I think, in 1978. Almost simultaneously, uh, three re researchers said, you know, he's right about all of this, but what's missing is, well, where were these, why what, weren't we getting 32 molecules of ATP? So they proposed that there were literally emergency exits along the electron transport chain that were controlled by what were called uncoupling proteins that could literally open the door of an emergency exit and let protons escape from the club instead of going all the way down through the revolving door. And they proposed that these escape hatches, and there were five of them, would be why in all these experiments, you never got to that magic number of 32. And so when I learned about uncoupling proteins uh, and I started putting two and two together, it, I realized that uh, a great amount of the calorie potential to produce energy was automatically being wasted right. and net out of the electron transport chain. And in fact, I didn't know this, but 30% of all the calories that we eat, never make it into ATP production. They are wasted out these emergency exits in the mitochondria. So now you go, well, wait a minute. If you're designing an animal, that's really stupid because now he basically has to eat 30% more food 
just to produce the energy to stay alive. So what's the deal? Well, one of the deals is in the process of letting these protons escape from the glove, they produce heat. And Mm -hmm. we happen to be warm-blooded animals. And believe it or not, even cold-blooded animals depend on this to keep their body temperature. And so heat production is an important part of this. But what became apparent, and we'll go into DMP in a minute, is that you could waste a lot of calories by opening up these emergency exits. You could literally do a caloric bypass. Well, it just so happens that ketones aren't some phenomenal fuel. It turns out that ketones are a phenomenal signaling molecule that actually, among other things, actually do three things. They tell mitochondria to waste fuel, to open up these emergency exits, which on the surface seems really stupid to do. Because ketones' original purpose was to be produced during starvation, to keep the brain kind of hanging in there until food arrives. And it would make no sense if you're starving to death to waste fuel. And then I stumbled upon an obscure paper by Dr. Martin Brand. And the paper was published in 2000. I recommend it to anybody because it's actually an easy read. And the paper is simple, uncouple to survive. And that's the name of the paper. And he said, in extremis, at all costs, a mitochondria has to protect itself from death because if the mitochondria dies, it doesn't matter what happens to the muscles, it doesn't happen to anybody else, you're screwed. So the mitochondria, should do everything in its power to protect itself. So stepping back for a second, producing energy is really costly. It's really damaging the mitochondria. The club becomes a mess. So if we actually waste some of all these people entering the club, the place calms down. So that's number one. Number two it's okay to waste energy, but you got to have a certain amount of energy production or things flutter to a stop. So it turns out that ketones and other substances actually tell mitochondria not only to waste some of the stuff out the side door, but to make more of themselves to share the workload. Now it really starts to make sense. Because, okay, you're protecting each individual mitochondria by having it work less but you're simultaneously adding more mitochondria to take up the workload, each at a reduced work. Uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say we have a dog sled, since it's now winter, and we have a two dog sled pulling a guy, and they're doing a lot of work. If we add six more dogs, we now have an eight dog sled. Each of those dogs now has to do about a quarter of the work that the two guys did, but you're going to get you know, you're going to go as fast, probably faster. So it actually makes sense to have a program to make a lot more mitochondria when times are tough. 